Good morning, and welcome to Central Presbyterian Church's online worship service for Sunday, April 26th, 2020. The bulletin for this service can be found at the description uh, accompanying this video on Facebook and YouTube, or you can head to our website, www.centralprespb.com, and the link should appear below this video or in our publications uh, link at the top of the webpage. With that being said, I'm going to ask you to turn your attention to the announcements on the back of the bulletin. The deadlines for the Junior High Jubilee and Montreat Youth Celebration for Senior High Students offered by the Presbytery of Arkansas have extended their deadlines for registration. Both trips have a few openings left, and if you have interest, interested youth, please feel free to contact me, Zach Cosner, uh, through the Contact Us link on the website or through our social media um, uh, accounts. Uh, Ferncliff has decided in coordination with the Arkansas Department of Health to cancel their summer camp programming. Uh, check their website, www.ferncliff.org, for more information. They're calling it their Summer of uh, Jubilee. Uh, archives of our online services can be found on Facebook and YouTube. E links to each are available on our website, like I said before, centralprespb.com. Uh, CPC now has online giving available. If you check our website, look for the Donate Now link at the top of the page. We take credit cards, debit cards, and checks. You can also set up recurring donations on a weekly, bi-weekly, or monthly basis. Let us worship God. In life, in death, in life beyond death, Jesus Christ is Lord over powers and principalities, over all who determine, control, govern, or finance the affairs of humankind, Jesus Christ is Lord. Of the poor, of the broken, of the sinned against, and the sinner, Jesus Christ is Lord. Above the church, beyond our most excellent theologies, and in the quiet corners of our hearts, Jesus Christ is Lord. Alleluia, Christ is risen. He is risen indeed. Alleluia. This is the covenant which I will make with the house of Israel, says the Lord. I will put my law within them, and I will write it upon their hearts, and I will be their God, and they shall be my people. I will forgive their evil deeds, and I will remember their sin no more. In faith and penitence, let us confess our sins to Almighty God, first using the prayer printed in the bulletin, and then silently. Risen Lord, how often you come to us, and we do not recognize you. In friends and strangers who seek and offer kindness, in words that make sense of our lives and the world around us, in living, enduring promises that we have all but forgotten, you come, O God. But our hearts are slow to see and honor you. Forgive us, we pray. Do not leave us, but stay with us, and awaken us to your presence. Kindle within us a deep and genuine love for you and for all who are, in, who are created in your image. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. As people born of water and the Spirit, we have died to the old life, and a new life has begun. God's grace is poured out upon us day by day. Come to the water and remember your baptism. Be thankful and live as one who has been raised to new life. In Jesus Christ, we are forgiven. Amen. Our first reading this morning comes from the first epistle of Peter, beginning with the first chapter at verse 13 and proceeding through verse 25. Let us listen for the word of the Lord. Therefore, prepare your minds for action. Discipline yourselves. Set all your hope on the grace that Jesus Christ will bring you when he is revealed. Like obedient children, do not be conformed to the desires that you formerly had in ignorance. 
Instead, as he who called you is holy, be holy yourselves in all your conduct. For it is written, you shall be holy, for I am holy. If you invoke as father the one who judges all people impartially according to their deeds, live in reverent fear during the time of your exile. You know that you were ransomed from the futile ways inherited from your ancestors, not with perishable things like silver or gold, but with the precious blood of Christ, like that of a lamb without defect or blemish. He was destined before the foundation of the world, but, without, but was revealed at the end of the ages for your sake. Through him you have come to trust in God, who raised him from the dead and gave him glory, so that your faith and hope are set on God. Now that you have purified your souls by your obedience to the truth, so that you have genuine mutual love, love one another deeply from the heart. You have been born anew, not of perishable, but of imperishable seed through the living and enduring word of God. For all flesh is like grass and all its glory like the flower of grass. The grass withers and the flower falls, but the word of the Lord endures forever. That word is the good news that was announced to you. Our second reading comes from the 24th chapter of the Gospel of Luke, beginning with the 13th verse and proceeding through verse 35. Again, let us listen for the word of the Lord. Now on that same day, two of them were going to a village called Emmaus, about seven miles from Jerusalem, and talking with each other about all these things that had happened. While they were walking and discussing, Jesus himself came near and went with them, but their eyes were kept from recognizing him. And he said to them, what are you discussing with each other as you walk along? They stood still, looking sad. Then one of them, whose name was Cleopas, answered him, Are you the only stranger in Jerusalem who does not know the things that have taken place there in these days? He asked them, What things? They replied, the things about Jesus of Nazareth, who was a prophet mighty indeed and word before God and all the people, and how our chief priests and leaders handed him over to be condemned to death and crucified him. But we had hoped that he was the one to redeem Israel. Yes, and besides all this, it is now the third day since these things took place. Moreover, some women of our group astounded us, they were at the tomb early this morning, and when they did not find his body there, they came back and told us that they had indeed seen a vision of angels who said that he was alive. Some of those who were with us went to the tomb and found it just as the women had said, but they did not see him. Then he said to them, Oh, how foolish you are and how slow of heart to believe all that the prophets have declared. Was it not necessary that the Messiah should suffer these things and then enter into his glory? Then, beginning with Moses and all the prophets, he interpreted to them the things about himself in all the scriptures. As they came near the village to which they were going, he walked ahead as if he were going on, but they urged him strongly, saying, Stay with us, because it is almost evening and the day is now nearly over. So he went in to stay with them. When he was at the table with them, he took bread, blessed and broke it, and gave it to them. Then their eyes were opened, and they recognized him, and he vanished from their sight. They said to each other, Were not our hearts burning within us while he was talking to us on the road, while he was opening the scriptures to us? That same hour they got up and returned to Jerusalem. And they found the eleven and their companions gathered together. They were saying, The Lord has risen indeed, and he has appeared to Simon. Then they told what had happened on the road and how he had been made known to them in the breaking of the bread. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Let us pray. 
Open now our hearts and minds, O God, by the power and presence of your Holy Spirit, so that as your word is proclaimed this day, we may hear with joy what it is you would have us hear, that hearing we might believe, and that believing we might live lives of richer and fuller service, glorifying you here on earth as you are glorified in heaven. Amen. Once there was a man and his son who were going with their donkey to the market. And as they walked along, they were passed by another man who said to them, You fools, what is a donkey for but to ride upon? So the man put his donkey on the, or put his son on the donkey, and they went on their way. But soon they passed a group of men, one of whom said, See that lazy youngster? He lets his father walk while he rides. So the man ordered his boy to get off the donkey, and he got on the donkey himself. And they hadn't gone far when they passed two women, one of whom said to the other, shame on that lazy lout to let his poor little son trudge along while he rides on the donkey. Well, initially our man didn't know what to do, but eventually he picked up his boy and placed him in front of himself so that both were now riding on the donkey. At last they reached the town and the passers-by began to jeer and point at them and the man stopped and asked why they were scoffing and the people replied, aren't you ashamed of yourself for overloading that poor donkey of yours? So the man and his son got off and tried to think what to do now. They thought and they thought until at last they cut down a pole, tied the donkey's feet to it, raised the pole to their shoulders, and thus they went along carrying the donkey amid the laughter of all who met them until they came to a bridge. When all of a sudden the donkey got one of his hind feet loose and kicked out, which caused the boy to drop his end of the pole. In the struggle, the donkey fell over the bridge, and because his front feet were still tied together, the donkey drowned. That will teach you, said an old man who had followed them, please all, and you will please none. That is one of my favorite Aesop fables because it speaks rather eloquently about the very real pressures to conform, as well as about the dangers that are inherent when one does conform, something about which the Church of Jesus Christ knows a great deal. Consider, for instance, the story of Dietrich Bonhoeffer. Dietrich Bonhoeffer was a professor of theology at the University of Berlin in the 1930s, and at that time, German Christians were divided over Adolf Hitler. One group had given in to the pressures to conform and allied themselves with Hitler. They formed an official German church which supported him. Bonhoeffer was among those who refused to go along with Hitler's anti-Jewish, radically German vision. And with others, he set up an underground church with that, which explicitly refused to conform to Hitler's vision. Needless to say, it was dangerous to resist, but resist they did. By 1937, Bonhoeffer had been fired from his teaching position and was forced to flee, Lon flee to London, England as a result of his resistance. And two years later, he was faced with a choice. He had been offered a prestigious teaching position at Union Theological Seminary in New York. He could have taken that position and lived out the rest of his life in safety and security. Or he had the option to return to Germany and head up an illegal underground seminary for the churches that refused to conform to Hitler's vision. He decided that his faith would be meaningless if he took the former, easier option. So he headed back to Germany. And eventually, he would abandon his commitment to nonviolent opposition to Hitler, 
and would get involved in a plot to assassinate him. That plot failed, and in 1943, Bonhoeffer was arrested, and on April 9, 1945, he was executed by the Nazis. Through all of this, what distressed Bonhoeffer most was the way so many Christians could sell out to Hitler's evil vision. How could people who confess the name of Christ so easily betray Christ? He became convinced that faith is not just what we confess on Sundays, but also how we live the whole of our lives. But one of the greatest ironies of history is that Bonhoeffer ultimately chose to confront evil on its terms. He chose to conform to the world's ways rather than allowing himself to be transformed by the gospel. True, and rightly so, he is considered to be one of the church's modern era martyrs, but the church of Jesus Christ must continue to wrestle with the entire legacy that he left behind, both his faithfulness and his wavering faith, which led him to believe there ultimately was no other way to confront Hitler than with more violence. I thought a great deal about these things as I considered our scripture readings for this morning, because early on in its history, the Church of Jesus Christ, though hardly seen as a threat to the prevailing cult culture and was in most cases ignored, soon ran into the problem that as its proclamation of the good news of Jesus Christ drew more and more converts, it would come under more and more pressure to conform. Christians possessed a value uh, system and a set of beliefs that were very different from those of the Roman Empire. And so at that point, wrote Paul Ochtemeyer, a radically conformist society began to demand of the Christians that they act like everyone else in their neighborhoods. <clears throat> taking part in festivals that included sacrificing to local gods, sharing in banquets where the meat served came from animals, sacrificed, was sacrificed to pagan deities, <coughs> burning a pinch of incense before a bust of <clears throat> the emperor and declaring Caesar is Lord. All things faithful Christians could not do. It got to the point where even the title Christian was enough to generate hostility. It was at that point that First Peter was written. <clears throat> Our letter is an appeal to his readers to live as good people in the midst of such social pressure. Where pagan virtues were the same as Christian virtues, things like honesty and respect for legal authorities, avoiding stealing or murder, <coughs> Christians were to follow them, of course. But where pagan customs and demands forced denial of faith in Christ, the pressure was to be resisted. Such resistance was demanded of the community of grace. So our author writes, as it were, of grace under pressure. What made this pressure to conform even greater for those to whom 1 Peter was originally addressed was the fact that they had originally been pagans. They had once been counted among those who bowed down to idols, who sacrificed to pagan deities, who had confessed that Caesar was Lord. And while they conformed to the values and beliefs of the culture, everything was just fine, but somewhere along the way, they heard a different call, the call of the Holy Spirit, and their lives were changed forever. Suddenly they worshiped only one God, the true God. Suddenly they knew a different Lord, not Caesar, but Jesus Christ. Suddenly their lives were marked by a different allegiance. Their trust in Christ had turned these believers into outsiders in their own families, outcasts in their own communities. 
and exiles from their own countries. The more faithful they were to Christ, the more pressure they faced to renounce Christ and to embrace once again their old ways. But precisely because they were under such pressure to conform, the need to remain faithful was all the more important. Hence, the letter exhorts them like obedient children. Do not be conformed to the desires that you formerly had in ignorance. Instead, as he who called you is holy, be holy yourselves in all your conduct. For it is written, you shall be holy, for I am holy. There was no room for compromise with the prevailing culture. To conform in even the tiniest detail would be to abandon the faith altogether, and a holy God demands a holy people just as a God of hope creates a hopeful people. The people are therefore called upon to resist the temptation to turn away from an inheritance that is imperishable, undefiled, and unfading. In spite of all that beckons them away from a life in Christ, they are to live lives of grace. They are not to retreat, but rather are to stand firm. They are not to shrink in the face of opposition, but rather are to love all the more. They are not to wither under the pressure, but rather are to remember him whose steadfast faithfulness led to crucifixion for their and our sake. Which I think, or I think here is where our reading from Luke comes into play. The events take place on the evening of that first Easter, and we encounter Cleopas and another unnamed disciple of Jesus walking to a village called Emmaus. What I find most telling in this story are the words, but we had hoped that he was the one to redeem Israel. They had hoped. But those hoped were, hopes were apparently dashed. Disappointment and despair were the orders of the day. Jesus had refused to conform to the values and beliefs of those in power. And where did it get him? Crucified, dead, and buried. And now not even his body remained. Some have said that he was risen, but how could that be? So we are told they were on the road back to Emmaus. In his book entitled The Magnificent Defeat, Frederick Beekner says, Emmaus is that place that we go to in order to escape. Emmaus is whatever we do or wherever we go to make ourselves forget that the world holds nothing sacred, that even the wisest and bravest and loveliest decay and die that even the noblest ideas that people have had, ideas about love and freedom and justice, have always in time been twisted out of shape by selfish people for selfish ends. Nothing would make our culture happier than for the church to give up any hope in the sacred. Nothing would make our culture happier than to conform to the empty consumerism, greed, and idolatry that tells us we must buy more, spend more, and be more, because that is the only real value in life. And that, it seems, is where these two disciples were heading. But Jesus appeared to them and unlocked the scriptures for them and showed that his death and resurrection were in accordance with what God had willed. Then later, while at table with Jesus, they suddenly recognized him, and they would eventually return to Jerusalem and would bear witness that Jesus Christ has risen. In like manner, our Lord continues to appear to us at the pulpit where he is proclaimed as Lord and Savior and where the good news of his death and resurrection is preached at the font where we die to sin and rise to new life in Christ and are welcomed and received into the household and family of God, and at the table where we recognize him in the breaking of bread. 
our Lord continues to appear to us and call us to faithful living, to call us away from Emmaus, because we are under as much pressure to conform today as the church has ever been. It would be easy for us today to join the people protesting and say that we should reopen different parts of society in order to protect economic or libertarian interests. But is that being faithful when testing is still widely unavailable and asymptomatic people may unwittingly pass on COVID-19 to others? Is it being faithful to give a vocal culture, itching for things to get back to their perceptions of normal, the wherewithal to put the lives of everyone else in jeopardy? I get the desire to see others. I get the desire to be able to go out and do things freely. I get the desire to get the economy functioning again. I miss seeing you on Sunday mornings, but that desire to see you and worship again in person cannot be rushed out of selfish desires. To assemble without widespread testing is tantamount to putting the Lord our God to the test. The temptation is ever before us to hold nothing sacred, to go along, to get along, to take the easy way out instead of risking all for a cause greater than ourselves. But precisely because this temptation is ever before us, we are called to ever more faithful living. For that is our only hope of being holy as God is holy. It's like the story of the man who one day approached a prophet and said, Prophet, why do you bother? You have been prophesying for 15 years and still things are the same. Why do you keep going? To which the prophet simply replied, Don't you know? I do not prophesy to change the world, but to prevent the world from changing me. May God grant us all the grace to live such faithful lives. And to God be all the honor, glory, and praise forever. Amen. I would ask now at this time that you would please join me and confirm what it is we believe using the words of the Apostles' Creed that can be found in your bulletin. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Ghost, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Ghost, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Let us now return to God our thanksgiving through our tithes and offerings, which can be done using the link that says Donate Now at the top of our webpage, www.centralprespb.com. It is right and our greatest joy to give you thanks, eternal God, for all the blessings that you have bestowed upon us, but we are most grateful for the gift of your Son, Jesus Christ, and your abiding and sustaining Holy Spirit. For our Lord reconciled us to you and to one another, opening the door to eternal life. Your Holy Spirit continues to confront us, convict us, correct us, and equip us to enter the world and share the good news of your redeeming grace. And so, O oh God, we offer up our time, our talents, our treasures, and indeed our very selves for you to use as you see fit. Until that most glorious day when at the name of Jesus, every knee in heaven and on earth and under the earth shall bend and every tongue shall confess him Lord to your honor and glory. Amen. At this time, let us share our joys and concerns. Uh, we continue to pray for um, those first responders and uh, medical professionals and 
um, the um, essential personnel that are working at uh, grocery stores and fast food restaurants and those preparing to uh, re-engage uh, with the wider public as uh, things begin to reopen. Um, we pray that those people um, are uh, protected and are um, cautious about their interactions with each other uh, for to keep them from spreading or contracting uh, the coronavirus. Uh, we continue to pray those who were affected by the recent storms here in South Arkansas and in um, Jonesboro as they continue the process of rebuilding uh, in uh, the um, issues that we're currently going through with this pandemic. Holy and gracious Father, we give you thanks that the Lord Jesus Christ is in fact the same today as he was yesterday and will be for all of our tomorrows. Please be with those that we mentioned here who are, who are dealing with the coronavirus, uh, those who are dealing with the loss of loved ones, who are dealing with uh, the virus itself, or family members or friends who have contracted the virus, uh, those who are helping to heal the sick, and those who are uh, dealing with all of the, the stuff that goes along with uh, uh, operating in this pandemic. Uh, please continue to be with those who are recovering from the recent storms here in South Arkansas and the storms that hit Jonesboro. Give us hope that we, as we strive to be faithful as disciples of Jesus Christ, who taught us to pray together saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Go out into the world in peace, to love and serve the Lord, rejoicing in the power and presence of God's Holy Spirit, taking today's message with you, and may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all now and forevermore. Amen.